Surely, at this point, you've seen Imperial Yeast's amazing selection of high-quality brewing yeasts over at imperialyeast.com. But you might not be as familiar with Imperial Yeast's special order yeast bank. In addition to their tried-and-true core strain selection, Imperial Yeast has a number of ale or lager strains, Britannomyces, Kvike, and other yeasts available for special order. If you're looking to match a yeast strain currently in production or just looking for something new to play with in the brew house, reach out to Imperial Yeast customer service to see what they may have in store. Special Special order strains are subject to a 10 liter order minimum and require a two to three week propagation time, but they might just be what you're looking for for your next brew. You can get more information about Imperial Yeast's special order strains by calling 503-477-5826 or emailing customer service at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. Let's face it, making beer produces a lot of waste, like spent grains or water used for cleaning and sanitation, trube at the bottom of the kettle and fermenter. What do you do with your brewery waste? Have you ever thought about making soy sauce from spent grains or yeast garum from spent yeast? I'm your host, Cade Job, and today in the lab, I'm speaking with Jonah Greenbaum Schinder, the head of food fermentation and business development at Escarpment Labs, who's been playing around with koji mold to upscale their yeast production waste streams from dumping it down the drain to finding ways to recycle it and maybe make a little extra money from it as well. So in this episode, we're talking about how Escarpment Labs is using koji rice combined with brewer spent grains to make shoyu or soy sauce. Yes, for real, you can make your own soy soy sauce with spent grains and koji mold. Could you imagine having your own line of specially crafted soy sauces? Well, that's exactly what Jonah and the team at Escarpment imagined for you, and they've done the research and started perfecting the process for making great soy sauce out of this brewery waste product. But yeast manufacturing also has a significant waste stream in in the form of spent yeast. And it turns out you can make koji mold, you can use koji mold to turn spent yeast into a fish sauce substitute. Wait, fish sauce Yes, fish sauce without the fish. Spent yeast fermented with koji rice makes yeast garum. And in this episode, we'll talk about the science behind why using koji is is able to make these products. And we'll talk about how to make shoyu and yeast garum from these waste streams. Anyone can do it, commercial brewers and or home brewers. Shows like this are made possible in part by the generous support of our patrons. If you're not already a patron, please visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. We work hard to provide a lot of free content, including an experiment article and a secondary series article like the Hop Chronicle, Short and Shoddy, or Brew It Yourself every week and two podcasts, all for free. The benefit of becoming a patron is that in addition to the feel-good feeling of supporting us, you also get some pretty good uh, (laughs) rewards for your support. At different pledge levels, you get access to unpublished contributor recipes, discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session. So this month's guest is Nick Harris from Berkeley Yeast, who will be available to talk to patrons about genetically engineered yeast. So Nick was a guest on episode 20 of the Brew Lab, where we talked about the different brewing challenges that can be solved with genetically engineered or genetically modified yeast, from diacetyl reduction to increased tropical fruit character, among many others. To be part of this live cast, please sign up to become a patron at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Also, if you're not doing this already, we'd love for you to support us by using the links at brewlosophy.com slash support. When you use those links to start your shopping process, we get a small kickback. It doesn't change your shopping experience or prices. It just helps to support the work we do at Brewlosophy. All you have to do is start your shopping experience by clicking the links listed at brewlosophy.com slash support. Feedback is brought to you by the team at Haas, who are constantly innovating to provide solutions for your brewing problems. We've all had hazy IPAs, and since you're listening to this show, you know that getting a stable haze can be a challenge. Imagine you've brewed this awesome hazy IPA. You added your Whirlpool and dry hops. It's looking great while fermenting, and then it drops crystal clear after you crash it. Well, the folks at Haas have you covered. Introducing Hop Haze, their newest brewing product. Hop Haze can be used in post-fermentation to add a stable, hazy complexion to beer and other beverages. It's 100% hop derived, flavorless in beer, and requires no additional mixing before use. And the haze stability is the same as the shelf life of your beer. So if you want to achieve that juicy look in your next hazy IPA, be sure to try Hop Haze. And also check out all of Haas's other innovative products at johnihaas.com. That's John, the letter I H A A S.com. All right, listener Tui wrote in from Denmark. He says, Hello, Kate. I'm sadly not a homebrewer myself, though with a great interest in all things beer, and I've been binging the podcast lately and loving the content. There's so much exciting information, and you do a terrific job of presenting it. Well, thanks, Tui. 
I know you've touched on this peripherally in a couple of episodes, but has there been any research done and could you do an episode on the role of alcohol content and its sensory role in flavor extraction, per- perception, mouthfeel, etc.? I yearn for lower ABV styles, but often find them lacking in terms of especially hop aroma and flavor that I love in IPAs. I'm assuming this mostly pertains to cold side hop additions and ethanol as a solvent, but I'm wondering if there are other things going on. Maybe using products like Incognito or Spectrum could be a way to realize the dream of something like a 3 to 4% uh, hazy IPA that doesn't feel lacking, or maybe the ABV sets a limit of sorts. We'll be interested to find out. Kind regards from Denmark, 2A. Uh, so, Tui, these are fantastic questions. And by the way, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. If I'm not, I apologize. Uh, but I got some feelers out to see about doing an episode on this in the future. And in the meantime, I reached out to Jeff Daly, uh, the uh, sensory manager at Haas, to, for his help. And uh, here's what he said about your questions. So he said, on the low alcohol side, we've mainly focused on beers in the 5 to 6% zone with some experience with 3 to 4. Using products like Lupamax, Spectrum, Incognito, and some post-fermentation flavor additives all will contribute to improved hot flavor. There's diminishing returns related to usage, but be, but the careful balance, of, <laughs> careful balance of oil and inclusion of some hot material for mouthfeel is necessary. Ethanol is a critical solvent for extracting hot flavor and aroma and has a major impact on both trigeminal trigeminal chemisthesis and volatilization of compounds in retronasal olfaction. Thanks, Jeff, for making me (laughs) pronounce that on air. Um, That just means I have to get Jeff back on to tell us what those words mean. Um, And these will all contribute to higher hedonic feedback on the finished beer, but experimentation will find the right balance. So I think to synthesize, alcohol is important to extracting hot flavor and aroma, but yeah, you may be able uh, to use some of these products like Lupamax, Spectrum, or Incognito to help contribute hot flavor to lower ABV beers. Um, um, and more exp- more experimentation is certainly needed. So thanks, Tue, for the question. I'll see what I can do about getting a show on this topic. All right, I'll be right back after the break talking with Jonah Greenbaum Schinder about making shoyu and yeast garum from Brewery Waste. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. There are many waste streams that come out of the brewing process like cleaning liquids, trubes, spent hops and yeast, and brewers spent grains. And transforming these waste streams is an important part of becoming sustainable brewers. So with me in the lab today to talk about how to turn uh, two of those waste streams, brewers spent grain and spent yeast, into seasonings like soy sauce and fish sauce uh, is Jonah Greenbaum Schinder, the head of food and fermentation, uh, food fermentation and business development at Escarpment Labs. So Jonah, welcome to the Brew Lab. Hi there. I'm super happy to be here today. So I, I'm happy for you to be here too. And uh, first of all, I mean, as a brewer, I wasn't even aware that Escarpment Labs had a food fermentation department. I mean, that's pretty cool. What kind of uh, what kind of fun projects do you get to work on on the food side? Uh, I, this is definitely kind of especially anchoring to beer. This has been one of our uh, more exciting R and D moments. Uh, I think it just kind of spun out of a general love of fermentation, especially between uh, myself and Rich and a few other folks at Escarpment. And uh, the pandemic kind of hit at a perfect time of wanting to look into other microbes outside of yeast uh, that were food adjacent or food related. And uh, with a lot of time at home, I kind of started tinkering, namely with koji, which we'll talk about, and, and with tempeh spores as well. Oh, yeah, that's that's so much fun. I mean, I, I I always forget, right? I mean, I'm so I'm so deep into beer, right? That, that and I think like when I think fermentation, I think beer. But there are so many different things uh, that that ferment. And koji is a 
is a cool part, right? I mean, that's like made for soy sauce. It's made for, uh, you know, um, uh, a sake, right? I mean, that that's like the big one that, that, that everybody knows about Koji. It's like, oh, yeah, sake is another alcoholic beverage. But then there's all kinds of other things. There's pickles. There's sauerkraut. There's, you know, a huge amount of different foods uh, that are made using fermentation. Fish sauce is another great example. And, of course, you can't really make fish sauce from um, brewing waste because we don't use fish in beer. <laughs> but you've got a really cool alternative in yeast garum. So this is going to be pretty cool. I mean, I'm pretty excited about this episode. It's kind of a crossover of like food fermentation and brewing science. Um, and of course, it's a brewer. It's a brewing waste product. So but you uh, first a little bit about you. So again, head of food fermentation and business development at Escarpment Labs. And you have a bachelor in fine arts in theater production from Ryerson and then a master's of business entrepreneurship and technology at the University of Waterloo. So that sounds kind of like an interesting story. How'd you find your way to Escarpment? I uh, I moved to Guelph where Escarpment is based uh, about five years ago. My wife is a physician. She was a physician uh, in residency and was like, we're moving to Guelph. And uh, <laughs> so off we went. And uh, I happened to meet a couple of local brewers at the time and was between jobs and got really into beer brewing as a home brewer. Um, I find that generally if there's something I'm excited about, like I'll, I'll dive head first into it. And so that was beer for me for, uh, well, still is. Uh, and I just happened to be actually in a local ramen spot in Guelph with my wife and who should walk in, but Richard from Escarpment Labs, <laughs> who I knew from Instagram okay. and, uh, with a bit of, of, uh, push, pushing from my wife, uh, I went up and introduced myself and we started messaging about beer and uh, initially at Escarpment I was the homebrew lead. I, I packaged homebrew, I sold homebrew to customers, to shops, etc. And that was kind of my in uh, into the world of Escarpment Labs. That's that's an amazing story, right? I mean, that's really cool to think about. Like, you know, you're a homebrewer and you're following this person on social media or Instagram, and then he walks into the ramen shop that you're sitting at. Um, and well, and whoa, let's take it full circle. Now you're making soy sauce with brewers, <laughs> brewers grains. Yeah, right? it's definitely a full circle moment. Wow, that's really cool. And how cool? Yeah, Richard's a fun, fun guy. I've obviously had him on the podcast before, um, and hope to have him back on the podcast again soon. Uh, but this is this is uh, th- th- this is going to be like I said, this is a really fun episode. So, so what we're talking about today um, is essentially a novel way for brewers to use brewer spent grain and spent yeast to turn it into something that's usable. So it's sort of a sustainability um, episode, but the cool part is it's using koji. It's using this um, other, uh, let's call it microbial cocktail, I guess maybe is the best way to say it, to turn brewer spent grain into something completely different. It's kind of like that Monty Python. And now for something completely different, we're going to talk about soy sauce (laughs) on the brew lab. (laughs) Uh, but hey, yeah, it works, and it's really cool research. Uh, so the, the first question I wanted to ask is, is, where did you guys come up with this idea? So, I mean, I think with like all food and fermentation in general, like we stand on other people's shoulders. Uh, it's not as much as it's kind of a novel idea that we're definitely playing with and kind of uh, talking about a lot. There are lots of great people who have come before us who have. Uh, and in the case of Koji, you know, thousands and thousands of years yeah, of people who sure. come before us who have figured out how to wrangle these microbes and, and utilize their powers and, uh, and the culture that kind of comes with them. Uh, the things that I would point to specifically for me would be people like Sandor Katz, who's like a kind of rock star in the fermentation world. Uh, he wrote The Art of Fermentation, uh, talks about Koji in, in that book specifically and a few others. Uh, the Noma Guide to Fermentation, which I'm sure a bunch of people who are listening uh, are at least aware of, which mm-hmm. has a huge section on Koji, on miso, on shoyu, on garum, which we'll talk about as well. Uh, and then there's two guys in the States, uh, Rich Shi and Jeremy Mansky, who wrote a book called Koji Alchemy. And that also... Uh, talks about kind of more esoteric or more novel ways of, of working with these microbes to make things that are a bit less traditional. Yeah. Um, a Noma guide has a, as a spent or not spent, yeah, spent grain or uh, sorry, a, a yeast 
garum that that you would use uh, baking yeast for, and we've kind of uh, tweaked that with you know we have a lot of yeast kicking around. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's surprising that escarpment has yeah. so much yeast kicking around there too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it, oh, interesting. So it's like several different books have talked about you know uh, um, the art of fermentation. I mean that's kind of a big deal, right? I mean that's a big point. I mean I, I, I was saying earlier, you know, I'm so deep in beer that I kind of when I think of fermentation, I automatically think alcoholic beverage. But again, this is something that's been happening for thousands of years. I mean, fermentation is essentially a food preservation method, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, before there were fridges, there was, you know, winters where people needed to be able to, you know, keep the harvest from the fall available so they had food to eat. And, you know, I mean, fermentation being, you know, a, a form of controlled rot in a lot of senses. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. Yeah. you know, doing that in a way that allowed people to live. Yeah, exactly. Safely. Right, right. And I mean, all these different fermented products. I mean, I was t- I was talking with somebody the other day um, about it. I, we, we have sort of a close relationship in, in Dr. Shellhammer's lab with uh, Chris, Dr. Chris Curtin. Um, who's, we kind of like share an office space together and his focus is very much on like fermentation microorganisms. Um, so he's sort of the microbiology side and we're sort of the chemistry side. And I was talking the other day with a couple of his students about how like every culture it feels like has something fermented that they can turn to, right? It's like, oh yeah, this is our thing that we have uh, that's fermented. And of course, like shoyu soy sauce, fish sauce, I mean, all these amazing seasonings, yeast, garum, um, you know, these amazing um, amazing seasonings come from uh, fermentation. And so that's pretty cool. So we're going to get into that a little bit and what each of those mean. But another question too is, is um, you know, a really cool application of this is what you guys refer to as upcycling uh, a, a waste stream. And it's, uh, you know, it's really rare that I see a yeast company working in like brewery waste, right? I mean, usually the yeast company is, is working on the fermentation. How do we make beer taste better? But this is using yeast to upcycle a waste stream. So talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in the world that we're all aware is kind of burning in some sense. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. being in an industry that uses a lot of water specifically, uh, you know, if there are small or large ways that we can make impact on, uh, you know, utilizing what would be a waste stream and turning that into something of further value. I mean, from a capitalistic perspective, like that's great. We're turning garbage into money and that's cool. Mm-hmm. And from, you know, using kind of all parts of the animal as a, a bit of a, a metaphor, but yeah. uh, you know, taking things uh and and just kind of utilizing all of its potential before it's discarded. Uh, you know, a lot of fermentation in general is is you know something that you know maybe it's the the cabbage that's about to go bad and and we're going to salt it and make sauerkraut or you know you know really using every bit of every possible uh, input. And so again with having a lot you know we have expired yeast that's beyond spec that sits around and we have these incredible microbes beyond yeast that uh can kind of transform flavors and transform uh materials you know let's kind of you know throw those things together and see see what can happen and in the brewery space obviously with spent grain like it, you know, I know there are a lot of breweries that give their spent grain to farms uh, or, you know, it's composted and that's a great application to get it out and not just into a landfill. But, you know, what if we could be consuming that a second time over and, you know, really gleaning all that there is to be had from those sources. Yeah, I mean, that would be kind of cool too, right? To like, so I, I, I could think, I, I think I even mentioned this to Richard too. With, I mean, there's food implications and different laws and regulations. Um, but whenever I was talking to Richard about this at the Brewing Summit, I, I mentioned to him, uh, you know, hey, this would be kind of cool, right? I mean, I could imagine like walking into a tap room and you've got their taps on, but then you've also got like a range of sauces that are made by the brewery, right? From their like ways products. And I was just thinking like, that'd be really cool to have like your local brewery's soy sauce, right? Um, uh, and, and use that as a seasoning. Yeah, I think a lot of what excites people about craft beer in general is kind of, you know, at least the idea of like lower impact, you know, like, you know the thousand mile radius of, you know, ingredients potentially and just like that locality. So, you know, if that can be transferred from beer into, you know, other things that are on the table, especially with brew pubs, like that's, that's exciting for the consumer. It's exciting for 
the owners as well, I think. Yeah, exactly. Oh, brew pubs is a great application here, isn't it? Right. And home brewers too, right? Home brewers and brew pubs, brew pubs, places that have like, you know, small amounts of grain of, of brewers spent grains. Well, small, I'm going to put that in like air podcast quotes, you know, <laughs> small amounts of brewers spent grains and, and spent yeast, but really the opportunity to play around and experiment um, and do things with those in a way that other larger breweries may not have that ability. Um, but you mentioned earlier that you've got a lot of other alternative, micro, I'm going to call them alternative microorganisms because it's not Saccharomyces cerevisiae that we're talking about um, in this case. But we're going to focus on koji today. So what is koji? Koji, yeah. Um, koji is uh, like uh, brass tacks uh, is typically a, a microbe called Aspergillus oryzae. Um, there's also some other Aspergillus that... Uh, kind of exist in the world of koji soj is another one but but primarily it's aspergillus oryzae uh aspergillus is a, a filamentous fungi uh similar to tempeh related to i mean uh, yeast is technically a fungi uh, mushrooms obviously are fungi um but these are uh cultivated or not cultivated um wrangled uh, initially uh the word escapes me but uh not wild domesticated uh, domesticated there you go domesticated organisms uh what makes the kind of traditional koji exciting is that uh, there are aspergillus in the world uh that are toxic that uh, release neurotoxins uh can be quite harmful to a human to ingest Uh, at some point in somewhere in east asia uh, someone i think probably came across some steamed rice that smelled sweet and instead of having what would have at the time been a, the traditional black mold of Aspergillus had white mold on it. It was an albino s- species that they had come across. And this was domesticated into kind of the koji that we uh, know today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and we mentioned earlier that, I mean, koji has been used, you know, for thousands of years um, by humans. Right. So uh, you mentioned, again, that somebody has domesticated, uh, you know, this what was black mold and maybe poisonous into this white mold and it smells good. And then they kind of they pick it up and go, huh, OK, let me taste this. They taste it. They didn't die, first of all, <laughs> which, yeah. which is good. Right. Um, but it and actually we thank them for their service. you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. But so koji has been used for a lot lot of different things in that aspergillus orzi orzi or orzi orzi i'm probably i'm who knows i i don't know how to pronounce it but it all, all bets are off whenever you pronounce microbiology <laughs> names <laughs> Uh, but but that's but so I, I guess um, you know I, I talk to me first about like how koji has been used and then we'll talk specifically about the aspergillus orzie yeah so koji has been used i mean uh we can talk about japan which is kind of where i have a bit more of a understanding mm-hmm. obviously like these they have different names for the same microbes in, in China and in Korea and Japan, all over Asia. They're using these microbes for off, often for rice based alcoholic beverages. Um, the kind of exciting thing about uh, Koji from a scientific perspective is that it's a bit of a, a oh my goodness, uh, words. It is a. Uh, a powerhouse of uh, enzymatic activity, things like uh, amylase and protease being the kind of two primary things, a bit of lipase, which deals with fat, but uh, we're more focused on what it can do to uh, starches and to proteins being uh, for starches, amylase and proteins for protease. Um, So in the case of rice, you would grow it on rice. And instead of like what we do conventionally in beer with malting grains, uh, which allows for uh, once heat is reapplied to for the malting process and for sugars to be gleaned out of malted barley. Uh, this does this kind of in a live uh, moment. So you grow koji on rice for two days, you harvest it, and then you mix it with more rice that is steamed but not inoculated and it will break down the simple sugar or the sugars into simple fermentable sugars that can then uh be eaten up by yeast there is also a you know as long as koji has been around sacrifices has been in that mix 
mm-hmm. gleaning those sugars and turning them into alcohol. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, it's like aspergillus does the step of the mash, right, for for brewers. So when you're mashing in beer, you're taking that starchy. You, well, it's malted so that there's enzymes that are present in the actual grain, and then you're releasing those enzymes in the mash process so that the enzymes can then break down those starches and turn it into fermentable sugars. But aspergillus orzea, that's the really cool part about this fungi, right? Uh, that that it does that for you. It doesn't require a mash step. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got, you know, you do have to steam the rice to sort of break open, um, you know, the starch molecules. But then aspergillus comes in and it starts just chewing up those starch molecules and producing fermentable sugars. And it doesn't consume the fermentable sugars. Well, it consumes a little bit, but not a lot. And then enter Saccharomyces cerevisiae and boom, sake, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. That's that's exactly how it's done. And so, yeah, there there is a mash step, but there's no malting step, which is, right, you right. know, uh, you know, I mean, it's just a different way to make alcohol. But it, uh, given that rice is the primary focus for alcoholic beverages in in Asia, that's that's what they've done. Yeah. Um, so, like, that's obviously the primary thing is sake, but then. Uh, when you get into enzymes that make sugars available and turn proteins into amino acids, there are other things that can happen beyond alcohol or beyond primarily alcoholic ferments. And that's when you get into things like miso, and that's when you get into things like garum and soy sauce. Soy sauce has some level of alcoholic component, but there's also acetic acid going on. There's also other bacteria yeah, uh, you know, floating around in the in the liquid, as well as you know, you have the breakdown of proteins. Uh, and we can talk a bit more specifically when we get into kind of what we're putting into spent grain shoyu and soy sauce. But by you know, we're not just looking for an alcoholic taste; we're looking for umami. Yeah, uh, is really what we're hunting for. And so that this enzyme this this enzyme factory you know kind of koji slathered in these uh (laughs) enzymes can do both of those things is is hugely exciting like that you know i mean we 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 like alcohol we like umami here we have them together you know yeah exactly right and it's just like such an amazing enzyme package too right like you mentioned in a minute we'll talk or after the break we'll talk about you know the the different specifics of it like shoyu soy sauce and and yeast garum but mo- but um uh glutamic acid like monosodium glutamate that that umami flavor uh that's comes uh, that the uh, koji is a powerhouse um, at, at yeah. producing and releasing that yeah and I mean, like, you know, at least where I'm at in my life, MSG is a beautiful thing. And you know, it's a mm-hmm. bit of a hot button topic among sure. foodies sometimes. But uh, but then also, you know, like that we have the ability to make glutamate uh, come to life in so many ways from from other applications besides just sprinkling an MSG is right is so exciting. And then, you know, kind of thinking about all of the things that you can do to to get that out of different food products is, is, you know, we're opening a whole can of worms here, right? I know, I know. And I'm so excited too to like talk about, you know, the different flavors and things that you get from different spent grains and stuff. But before we do that, I did want to talk about um, some way streams uh, in in brewing because again, that's kind of a big piece of this uh, is is way streams, right? So so let's talk about, I mean, I think a lot of brewers are going to have an understanding of, uh, of, of waste. I mean, almost every process in brewing um, has a way stream, but why don't you take us through a couple of those? Because I think that's an important piece of the sustainability aspect of this yeah, episode. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, so obviously when you're making beer or you, know, you have malted barley and you're mashing that and then you pull out the, the beautiful wort out of that that gets boiled and cooled and fermented into beer that we know and love. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for people who aren't quite as familiar, obviously, like once those grains have been... Uh, mashed and and the liquid has been extracted that's a waste product and and that can be you know kilos and kilos pounds and pounds Mm -hmm. of uh, you know hundreds of pounds depending on the the size of the brewery thousands of pounds of waste that uh is just you know carted off hopefully to a farm or into compost um but if we can take you know even 10 percent of that and and using the power of of these microbes like koji uh re-harvest you know some of of its potential into something else delicious then you know we're gleaning even more from 
you know, the energy basically that has been used to, to grow this barley, to malt this grain, to, you know, like there's a lot that goes into it energy wise uh, in order to, to make beer. And so if we can kind of piggyback on that for any means uh, of, of deliciousness, uh, that's definitely worthwhile. And then the other side for us, especially, you know, with, you know, we were primarily a liquid yeast lab. Uh, we sell yeast that is, uh, I mean, this is how we thought about it, at least, is, you know, we sell yeast that's, you know, either up to 30 days or up to 60 days old before its, you know, viability is beyond what we would sell it as. And so sometimes we end up with a little bit of extra. Sure. And, uh, you know, outside of disposing of that, you know, as just, you know, a bio waste, how can we, you know, make something valuable for us and delicious for others with those products that, you know, aren't totally useless and that we've spent a lot of time, money and energy into creating. Yeah. And so that's, that's uh, how we kind of landed on the yeast garum side of things too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's one that, that I think I was, I was surprised about too. Cause I think of, you know, I mean, brewer spent grains very obviously like a, that's a huge volume um, of waste whenever you're talking about from a brew house, like you said, kilos and kilos or pounds and pounds. I mean, it's just, it can be a huge volume um, of, of waste. So that's cool that we're able to upcycle and, and take that, um, you know, and a lot of breweries, I mean, I think almost every brewery um, is returning that brewer spent grain or take, or shipping it off to a livestock, right? Like you mentioned, which is a great uh, recycling use of it. Uh, but there are other things that we can do with it. But the yeast, like the spent yeast, that's not something I think about. I mean, most breweries are probably just dumping that down the drain, right? I mean, larger breweries, and depending on where you're at, you're going to have different things, you know, different regulations about what you can dump down the drain. But I think a lot of people are just taking all that leftover stuff. Uh, at the bottom of the fermenter and harvesting for the next pitch, but there's still a whole lot of yeast that's in there and the rest of it just goes right down the drain, um, you know, and yep. out the door, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, um, which ultimately like, isn't great for, you know, I mean, you know, regulations being what they are, wherever those right. breweries exist, but like, you know, just putting that into general wastewater is not awesome for, you know, infrastructure. Right. So if we can you know divert some of that too, for more delicious things, uh, Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I mean, and that raises a question too. So I guess we'll ask this before we go to the break. Um, you know, so there are other waste streams. Are you guys looking at tackling some of the other waste streams or just focusing right now on uh, spent grain and, and spent yeast? We have, we've had some people in uh, through, through some grants and some consulting uh, folks in with escarpment to look at, you know, what we, our, our, our process is very similar to a brewery in mm -hmm. that, you know, wort which is media for us and is not designed for flavor is used to propagate yeast and then when we're done with that media uh we dispose of it uh one way or another it is disposed of uh removed from the facility down the drain or otherwise and so uh there is alcohol in in that product that isn't really fit for like human consumption as far as drinking uh but we have had some conversations about, you know, hey, there's ethanol here. You know, can we upcycle this, you know, with a still or otherwise yeah, to yeah. end up with a food grade, fully upcycled ethanol product? And so that's something that we've kind of begun to think about, uh, you know, down the road a little bit. Uh, you know, perhaps there's a still uh, nearby that we can use to harvest, you know, totally upcycled ethanol, which is another thing that we think about. Yeah. Right. And I love that you guys are taking that, that, that aspect, right? Let, let, let's bring people in to look at where we have waste and see what we can do to minimize that or turn it into other things. Right. I mean, uh, you know, there was at the brewing summit, one of the big takeaways that I had was that to have a conversation about sustainability, you've also got to have a conversation about money too, right? Like brewers are brewers want to be sustainable, but they, they're not going to pay. They're not going to have increased costs in order to be sustainable. I mean, some, some people will, right? And that's great. And like you guys at Escarpment are doing a great job of that too. Um, you know, with with uh, you know 
your commitment to sustainability there uh, at, at escarpment. But if you can turn waste streams into something that's profitable and have a sustainability impact, that's a win-win-win, right? And that's totally. what they were talking about at the Brewing Summit is let's find these win-win-wins so that everybody uh, benefits from this. It's not like a cost, an additional cost that happens to the brewery. This is yeah, just... Yeah, because it'll never happen. But yeah, <laughs> if you can see, oh, in two years of you know upcycling ethanol or or turning spent yeast into, you know, a delicious sauce that we can sell to a consumer, you know, we can have an ROI and, and it'll pay for itself or, you know, maybe we'll even make money. Like, yeah. you know, who doesn't like the sound of that? Yeah, exactly. And I, and that's a, that's a big takeaway that I wanted to have um, uh, on this episode. I wanted to talk about that sustainability aspect, but I'm really interested to hear how this soy sauce and fish and uh, yeast garum is made. Uh, so let's take a quick break uh, and then we'll be back to talk about those, uh, the procedures and how, uh, how you make it and what it tastes like. So I'm excited. We'll be right back. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the time's IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the west and the east coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. I'm a big fan of East Asian cuisine, mainly because of all the seasonings from curry to soy sauce to fish sauce to G to spices like anise to cumin, coriander, turmeric. There are so many flavors and aromas that come together to create fantastic culinary exp- experiences. So Jonas, since we're talking about soy sauce and yeast garum, what's your favorite dish using one of those ingredients? I meant to give this more thought beforehand. I have like a few kind of go-tos <laughs> though for yeah. like you know uh, of what like even when i'm using store-bought uh, you know sanjay or whatever soy sauce mm-hmm. you know i have a, a like classic japanese like seasoning that i'll put together of soy sauce rice vinegar mirin uh sake if there's sake around uh ginger and garlic that kind of get mixed together in a vague ratio oh, yeah. maybe with a little bit of sesame oil and i'll put that on fish you can put that like as a base in for ramen. Um, that's that's a, a go to, and then also just like on rice uh, is a really good kind of oh yeah base for you know okay you know, I know what regular soy sauce is. How does this you know how does this vibe with with what we're putting together? Yeah, yeah, I love it. Like those those nice sauces, you know the the ginger and miso and and you know soy sauce uh, and and garlic. I mean, I just love how all that mixed together. But you know, one of my favorite. It's like the 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 simplest dish in the world. It, it's just like broccoli, steamed broccoli with soy sauce on it. <laughs> oh yes, steamed just... like microwave broccoli, like <laughs> yeah. a little a little soy sauce, yeah. maybe a hint of sesame oil. I yeah. could like I could eat that every day. Oh man, I'm it's... telling you, yeah, exactly. That's that. I don't. One of my friends uh, turned me on to that, and I have never looked back. Um, I just yeah. love it. <laughs> All right, well, so, so that's soy sauce. So let's talk about it. So how do you make soy sauce, or show you from uh, brewer spent grains? Yeah. So like soy sauce in general, I, I, I feel like in some ways with Koji and in soy sauce, like there was this awakening before I was into beer, you know, I didn't think of beer as being fermented. You just kind of think of beer as beer. And then it's like, Oh, there's, you know, fermentation and you're, you know, these sugars and, and yeast is added and Oh, it's a fermented product. Okay. And then soy sauce, I feel like for a lot of people is that too is, Oh yeah, I love soy sauce. I put it, you know, on sushi or, you know, in, you know, on this dish or that. And then you're like, Oh, you know, that's like a brewed 
fermented product is kind of uh, an awakening for some people. Yeah, for sure. Um, soy sauce is made traditionally from soy, obviously, and wheat, uh, wheat that has been uh, kilned or like baked until dark. And that's often where the color comes from. So those two things are soy is steamed, wheat is uh, is baked and then cracked, and then you grow koji on it uh, for two days. Uh, Aspergillus ariseae or Aspergillus soje also comes into play for kind of the lighter soy sauces, depending on the enzyme profile you're looking for or how long you want to ferment it for. And then you mix, traditionally you mix one part water with one part uh, mash or like soy uh, wheat blend and then uh, also traditionally you'd add about 12 percent salt by weight for the the total weight of, of water and <laughs> uh and uh protein mix yeah, um, yeah. that's a lot of salt <laughs> 12 yeah, percent so traditionally 12 yeah. percent and then you're going like two or three years uh mm -hmm. for a traditional soy sauce brew yeah so uh as with all things ferment, there are variables at play here being, you know, how much soy, how much wheat, how much water. And I mean, I guess, yeah, if you get into less water or more water, you end up into kind of like a uh, miso versus tamari kind of thing, which we can mm -hmm. talk about or, or skip over. Um, and then salt uh, being an inhibitor of, of, uh, and of bacterial activity or, uh, you know, more salt, uh, is a slower ferment and less salt is a faster ferment. So often for stuff we're doing at work, I'm in the like five to 7% range. And then I can turn out a sauce in uh, three or five months as opposed oh, nice. to yeah. 12 or 24 months, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, then we can always, you know, you can always do something longer, but if you want to get a sense of what's going on without waiting three years, it's nice to be able to speed that up. Right. Sure. So, so what, so it sounds like, so traditional soy sauces is, is like you mentioned, so it's that cracked wheat that's toasted to that dark color or roasted or however they're, they're doing that and dried and then mixed with soy. And then it sits uh, like in a barrel mixed with koji and soy. And then it sits, I guess, like in a barrel or in some kind of container for a while. Yeah. And yeah. we often do glass, although wood would be traditional. And then, yeah, koji is grown right on the soy and wheat substrate we call it uh -huh. um and so then all, that's also kind of you know uh probably somewhere on reddit i've come across someone else who was doing spent grain shoyus but you know wheat toasted okay now i'm thinking barley and, yeah. and yeah. kilned uh, -huh. uh, -huh. uh and so uh, often what we've done is we'll do one part so or one like uh soy and wheat one part and then spent grain for another part and then add, you know, so we have kind of three parts there ish, and then you're adding that equivalent in water as well. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of, you could have no wheat and just have spent grain, uh -huh. or you could just do exclusively spent grain, which we've also done. Um, there are advantages to including some protein from soy as far as getting more umami out of the protease enzyme. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, but it kind of depends on what flavors you're going for or, you know, how truly upcycled only do you want to be with these products. Right. So you so you can totally, you know, uh, uh, pick and choose and sort of mix there. Right. Like you can you can make. Um, well, 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 OK. Yeah. Let me make this comment about the mixing first. And then I had a question that popped into my mind like, holy crap, like, wait, there's still enough stuff in brewer spent grain to make soy sauce. But set that on the side for a second because um, I want to ask that. But but the mixing, right? So the different ratios of soy sauce and wheat and brewer spent grain, that's all totally into in your control. You can decide 100 percent spent grain or, you know, wheat or, you know, like you said, you said a third, a third and a third or maybe like 60 percent brewer spent grain and then 20 percent wheat, 20 percent soy sauce or any of those ratios, right? That's totally within mm -hmm. your control as the brewer of soy sauce from brewer spent grain. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, as we know from general brewing, you know, no one ever gets 100% efficiency out of out of their brewing grains. Right. And so that means inherently that, you know, okay, I got 75, 80, 85%, let's say, efficiency. There's still... 15 20 percent of the sugar is still available there yeah. the fact that they're also e easily available i think helps kind of kickstart the ferment while koji is doing the work on on the wheat or the soy to free up more sugars uh for microbes to consume 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? You've got the mashing step already done. You've already heated everything up. You've already released the starches and everything. You've already got some enzyme activity in the brewer spent grain. Then you throw the koji on top of it, and it's like, woohoo, here we go. <laughs> you know, exactly. it's already it's ready to go. It's like we've got everything released and ready. <laughs> That's cool. So, mm-hmm. do you have? Do you guys have any like any recipes or anything that you guys are, are willing to share? Or uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to end up, uh, I was chatting with Richard about it this weekend, about publishing something on the website that people can point to. But I nice. think generally we've had, I would say, better success. I have a barrel of, or it's, it's a plastic barrel, so it's not that exciting, but a barrel nonetheless <laughs> of like, I don't know, 30 or 40 liters of this stuff right now that's tasting pretty good. And it, it was uh, one part soy, one part wheat, two parts spent grain and then i think you know we initially shot to equal that weight in water mm-hmm. and it wasn't quite as viscous as we wanted because i guess the the amount of, of grain in there absorbed a lot of moisture so kind of water till liquidy uh, <laughs> and then yeah. i think we went eight percent salt of the total weight nice. so if, if that's i'll put something out there that can be pointed to so that uh, people who aren't following along with weird ratios still know what to do. <laughs> yeah, right. um, but that's kind of a general template for how we play with these things. That's cool. Right. And, and again, like you mentioned earlier, it's kind of like at your whim, like let's just see what you see, what you want to do. And I mean, I guess in terms of like equipment, you don't really need much other than like you said, it's like some, some soy, maybe some wheat, if you want to use those or brewing spent grain um, and just sort of a glass carboy or, you know, um, a plastic, anything that you can just put it in. I mean, even like a homebrew bucket, I guess would work for fermenting soy sauce. Yeah. I mean, obviously you need Koji, which, Oh yeah. yeah, Where, where can you get Koji or Koji spores? If you want to, you know, start at, at baseline is, uh, is something that we can also talk about well, after. Let's, but, let's, let's uh, do that. I'd, I'd love to do it right now since, since it came up, but you know, let, let, yeah. yeah. Where can you get Koji? <laughs> I mean, that's you know, uh, part of what has drawn us to exploring Koji. Uh, you know, in North America, a lot of the sources comes directly from Japan, um, and that's great in that you know that's where a lot of this culture kind of originates from. But also is somewhat clandestine as far as if you don't speak or read Japanese, it, it can be a little hard to navigate. Um, right. There are a few producers who sell actual Koji like rice things get confusing with koji because the spores are called koji the substrate when it's grown on is called koji but as far as as spores grown on a substrate being rice primarily uh Ascarmy labs does sell freeze-dried koji packs uh nice. mostly for consumers at this point although uh we take wholesale customers uh upon request uh there's cold mountain in the states who also sells uh and there are some spore sellers uh in the u.s and we're also exploring uh spore possibilities so that we could supply our own down the line would be uh would be a stretch goal so so right now it's sort of fair to say that like the 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 way to get koji is get it in rice right like it's made in rice and then freeze-dried and that's kind of the project product that that you that y'all sell and so would that would that be like using that for soy sauce would you just put that rice just like you know dump it in with the mix yeah. So in that case, you would uh, you, maybe you tweak your ratio. So instead of doing, you know, uh, like the traditional soy and wheat and water, you would do, you know, a third, a third, a third with our koji rice, soy and wheat or soy and spent grain or whatever ratio you want there. But a little goes a long way. And in, in sake <laughs> brewing, often you're only putting in about 10 percent of of your total rice amount is koji and the enzymes still go to town to make available uh the amino acids and the sugars that you need yeah so yeah i can imagine i i can imagine it it, like just like yeast right i mean we put in a tiny amount of yeast and it makes a whole lot of beer (laughs) so it's like once once those microbes have what they need they just go to town um like you said okay so how does how does this stuff taste right how does brewer spent grain soy sauce taste is it any different from soy sauce yeah i mean it's it's definitely like you can tell it's fermented it's saucy it's salty it's got umami i you know that kind of barley earthiness comes through often we find and most of the stuff that we've done has been like you know pale beer Mm -hmm. uh we haven't gone too 
deep on like stout show you although uh <laughs> richard has done some stout or uh, porter based uh show uh and i know he's turned them out pretty quickly like two or three weeks occasionally whoa uh, okay. at small scale yeah. Yeah. uh you know, you get a lot more color. You get a little bit more of that chocolatey flavor mm-hmm. uh, from from killing the malt, just like you would from you know, hot, like very darkened wheat. So, right, uh, definitely. Uh, I mean, it, it kind of has the smell and taste a little bit more like when you're mashing and you know, or starting to boil beer when you're home brewing and like that kind of aromatic barley smell comes <laughs> through, uh, which isn't traditional in shoyu, but is delicious nonetheless i love that smell i was just brewing yesterday and i just remember like it just like it smells it, you know the smell is just so Every pervasive time. it's so good yeah yeah, yeah. I, I love telling the story too i was in new zealand trying to find this brewery called garage project and and it's like there's a street that i thought went to it but it didn't it like dead ended at the end of this like hill um and it turns out garage project is sort of just around the corner on the hill but the street dead ended but i could smell it i could smell the beer and i was like i know we're close we've got to be close because i can smell it we're very close um, but that smell it's so it's so enticing and i think a lot of people listening to the show love that smell so that's awesome to hear that that comes through to the soy sauce because i can see that also adding a different element to your dishes right it's like um uh like you were mentioning earlier so sesame oil right like like just adding just a little bit of sesame oil just elevates a dish uh, so it's kind of like that with the brewer spent grains right you're getting that you know barley that malted barley uh flavor and really cool to hear that richard has also done some with porter because that was going to be one of my questions too right like is it limited to specific mash profiles like only pilsner grains or only light beers or can you just use whatever grains you have and make soy sauce from it yeah, absolutely. You could use whatever you have. And I think, you know, just like inputs uh, outside of brewing grains, you know, you're going to obviously affect flavor if you're, you know, brewing a, a New England IPA and, you know, there's a lot of wheat and there's a lot of oat in there, you know, you're probably going to get, you know, some more protein activity out of out of your you mash from the wheat and, you know, mouthfeel and, and creaminess perhaps even from I mean, creamy soy sauce sounds a little weird, but like that kind of <laughs> Uh, that mouthfeel that you get from oats, you know, will mm-hmm. will come through as well. Versus, you know, if you're doing a straight lager and you're putting pilsner grain exclusively in there, yeah, uh, you know, perhaps a, a cleaner, more straightforward flavor. Yeah, well, and I guess also that that sort of makes me wonder, like, are that would there be different, you know, protein profiles, you know, coming out of different mashes? And I would bet that there is, right? I mean, from different, absolutely, yeah, like you said, oats or or wheat. I mean, that's obviously going to be different than just barley, but you know, adding all this. And but you guys did do some analytical results um, on, on this, which I thought was really cool too. Um, in in the study that y'all presented at the Brewing Summit, it actually had twelve thousand parts per million glutamic acid, one point two percent glutamic acid so again that's the msg that's the umami flavor and that was really comparable to other soy sauces that's pretty cool yeah we were really excited to see you know to to get those measurements out of hplc and kind of see what the glutamic acid uh uh, you know how, how were we kind of comparing you know we can obviously based on taste alone imagine that it you know okay this tastes like soy sauce it's got some of that umami which is in some ways a little intangible but really like right. there are the numbers it really is comparable uh which is super exciting that you know we're making this product from from garbage for you know <laughs> by all other accounts right uh, right <laughs> that has you know something that people are willing to pay for that people strive to have in their dishes. Well, and one of the surprising things to me too, is it was also high in leucine and valine, which is, uh, which those are both essential amino acids for humans, meaning like like the human body doesn't synthesize them. So you have to consume them. And it was high in both of those too, which I thought was really cool. So it's like, you know, I mean, there's a huge amount of salt in it. So everything comes with its own balance, right? I mean, (laughs) you know, but, but to have, you know, uh, these essential amino acids hitting your gluten, acid number it tastes like soy sauce i mean this could be really cool i mean as a home brewer and lover of sauces i mean this could be something i might try to start doing myself is just like you know have my own house soy sauce <laughs> i mean that's so cool to and think about it's, once you start you're like i mean i have you know between the garums we do and the soy uh-huh. sauces we do like there is 
there's always some traditional like Sanjay bottle of <laughs> soy sauce in the house, but yeah, yeah, like yeah. nine times out of 10, I'm reaching for something that I've made myself, which is a nice addition to, you know, the cooking regimen. Too. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I use soy sauce oh, so often. I mean, I'm, at least once a week, if not multiple times a week, as I'm sure many people do. It's just such a great uh, seasoning uh, to, to add to dishes. But the other one that you mentioned is yeast garum. Um, so, so first of all, my question is, what is yeast garum? <laughs> yeah. So like garum is kind of the, the catch all term for, uh, I, I think traditionally warmer ferments, but like fish sauce is, is a fish garum, uh, uh, you know, traditionally fish sauce is made from putting whole pieces of fish into a container and the enzymes uh, from within the fish itself break down the fish and create fish sauce. Um, so uh, from really from the Noma guide, we've been inspired uh, to use koji instead uh, of fish guts because that can be a stinky thing. And uh, I've done stuff with garlic already in the facility and as much as we all love garlic, like uh, too much garlic was was uh, smelled throughout the facility for about three weeks. So oh, you know, yeah. I don't think I don't think they're going to let me do it with fish. Um, <laughs> but all to say that you know we have koji around, uh, and the enzymes uh, remain uh, powerful up until about sixty, and as you kind of sixty Celsius. Uh, uh, 155 or like we, we know from mashing as well you know once yeah, you yeah. get up to 160 things degrade but um so if you increase the heat uh to a comfortable but without destroying the enzyme level then you end up being able to use these enzymes kind of more quickly more effectively uh at least from a breaking down perspective there's uh certainly a difference if you were to make a like a a soy and wheat garum versus a s- traditional shoyu, they're going to have different flavors mm-hmm. because not all of the bacteria and microbes that exist at room temperature can flourish and add complexity to a sauce that's sitting at 60 degrees Celsius or 155-ish Fahrenheit yeah. um, for two months. But anyways, so uh, we wanted to see what would happen if we took our yeast and we did this with a few different types of yeasts of ours uh and and added water and koji and left them for a month or two uh because like i said we sometimes have stuff kicking around um and so we did that we did that uh mostly with a, a strain of ours called hornendal kvike um kind of on a, a whim there was some around we threw some in a glass container with koji and salt at about seven or eight percent maybe up to 10 i'd have to check my notes but i left it in an incubator that i have corralled for my ferments uh, at work uh, (laughs) at 60c for about two months and it it turned out awesome it was kind of this uh soy adjacent but like a little bit fruitier a little bit funkier uh sauce uh you know wasn't super fishy we have some uh aspirations of kind of getting into a mixed firm uh, as a base perhaps to kind of further out the fruitiness, further out the funk of some of these sauces. Britannomyces comes to mind as something that, you know, maybe we have a spent grain and, and Brett D hang out for <laughs> a couple of weeks or a month. And then we try and throw Koji on it and salt to, you know, further get a uh, flavor expression out of it. But uh and again, you kind of, we harvested it. It tasted really good. It went into my fridge and I used, a, you know, a 500 mil bottle in like two months of just kind of <laughs> nice. adding it onto different things like I would soy sauce. Sprinkling it on, right? Like it just like fish yeah. sauce, right? I mean, you, you like, like you mentioned earlier, your, your, uh, your dish is like, you know, mixing together soy sauce and, and uh, miso and, and, you know, garlic and ginger and all that. I love to do that too. I love to layer soy sauce and fish sauce together. So like mm-hmm. yeast garum, I would just, if I'm making soy sauce, I'd probably just throw a little bit of, of yeast garum on there too. But so that's interesting. So garum is essentially is is a warm ferment and like that's a very warm ferment right i mean if you're at 60 celsius around 145 150 uh fahrenheit something like that um 
the the yeah i mean that's that's really hot <laughs> um, yeah um, and like for a month or two <laughs> yeah yeah for a month or two so i bet you do get a lot of different flavors but so so you're throwing the coat so this is basically just the the spent media right so it's like wort media and yeast in there um mm-hmm. and is and is it alive yeast or is it dead yeast or it's alive before it goes in the fermenter. Almost all of our yeasts don't really tolerate that level of heat right. for too long. And, and that's fine. Like we're not seeking active fermentation out of it. We're really just seeking, uh, you know, the proteins, the amino acids that are already there to yeah. be further degraded by the koji to create sauce. I got so we've it, done yeah. some, mostly we've done it with liquid because uh, most of our stuff comes as liquid, but we, I have, uh, actually, uh, in the lab at work, I have a jar of dried out dead horn and all that I'm going to mix as just because it will be more concentrated mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to uh, using you know, from the end of a carboy of, of yeast, uh, mixing that in with water and salt and koji just to kind of see how it plays uh, without the wort aspect as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, okay, so and you you made you made a comment there that that's what you're trying to get. What you're trying to get is these amino acids and proteins that are inside of the yeast cell, and that's what you're trying to get out. I mean, which again makes sense why you need heat, right? Because you need to kill off the yeast cells so that you can get in and, and have access to these. And then the proteases in Aspergillus orzier and koji are what's going to go in and, and degrade those into, you know, like we talked about, glutamic acid and valine and leucine and all those other um, all those other awesome uh, umami amino acid sort of flavors. Uh, that's really, really fun. So so even dead yeast cells. So even like, you know, cells at the bottom of the beer tank that you're not harvesting um, from. Uh, from the fermentation could be used to make this yeast garum. Do you you have to, do you have to clean it at all? I mean, I know, so for you guys, for your process, I mean, you're obviously just using media and yeast. There's not like hops or other thing in there. We have like, uh, we use flex hops in our hops, uh, creating a a more beer like environment for our propagations behooves us and keeps, you know, any, you know, potential contaminants at bay as well. Um, but there is a hot particulate in there. Uh, I haven't tried this with yeast out of like a, a fermenter that actually has had real beer made out of it. Cleaning it might not be the worst idea, but also, you know, I wouldn't be too meticulous about it. Like aseptic technique is not really required because you're going to kill all of the yeast anyways. Yeah, but, you yeah. know, if it's particularly trubby, uh, I mean, you'll just end up with different results ultimately. Yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe something that tastes really good, or hopefully not something that tastes like stinky foot or like rubber or burnt rubber or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, you're using this to break down. You know, you're you're just trying to get access to those amino acids and stuff that are inside the yeast, um, and, mm-hmm. and and that's what that's all you're trying to get to. So yeah, it makes sense. I would love to see somebody do that with uh with just yeast out of a fermenter, right? Just take the yeast out of the fermenter and throw it in, um, you know at with some koji and let it go for, uh, you know, like you said, a couple months at, uh, at 60 Celsius and see what it tastes like. So you mentioned that yeast garum, um, you know, sort of tastes like fish sauce. It's not exactly like fish sauce. I mean, obviously, because you're not putting fish pieces in it, but how close is it? It's like a pretty happy vegan alternative, in, in my opinion. Like yeah. it's got a good amount of umami. We did, uh, you know, run glutamic acid checks on a bunch of our strains as well. And it actually turns out that Hornadol of our strains has uh, about 10,000 parts per million of glutamic acid, which is (laughs) a significant amount. Um, So a convenient choice for us to have chosen uh, as kind of our base for experimenting with, with Garum. Um, But yeah, it's definitely, you know, strong umami. There's a bit of fruitiness that comes out as well. And then I think kind of figuring out how to funk that up a bit more is uh, mm-hmm. is an ongoing uh, uh, process for us. But uh, I mean, we've made like uh, Richard has a good recipe for a Caesar, a vegan Caesar dressing that instead of like anchovies just uses, I think we have like a, a cashew miso that we've used before that's really tasty and uh and yeast garum are kind of the additions instead of like sardines and nice. eggs. And that and that makes it uh, makes it sort of taste as good as or, or yeah, has a nice vegan Caesar alternative, which is that's that's pretty yeah. cool. 
And I was going to ask if they're like if yeast strains would cause a difference, and you answered that question for me. So like Horn and Dahl had a really high parts per million, but you guys also looked at or parts per million of glutamic acid. But you guys also looked at a bunch of other strains, like you used a Vermont strain, Maison, and your Cali strain. Um, Cali actually almost had five hundred parts per million. Yeah, so it's like you know, I mean, Horn and Dahl had a lot, and that you know, and Horn and Dahl kind of as you know the as a fruitier kvike in general. Um, so that kind of was an appeal as far as a base, but you know, really any yeast is going to have glutamic acid uh, and you know proteins that can be you know gleaned out into delicious sauce. So you know, if it's Cali or if it's Vermont or whatever it is, you know, it's worth trying even if it's not Hornadol. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like, I mean, pretty much any yeast, it's worth trying. Again, I want to see if somebody just take it out of the fermenter, right? Like yeast out of the bottom of the fermenter and go make some uh, some yeast garum with it and see what happens. I yeah. mean, of course, you have to have a way to heat it over uh, over some time, um, you know, that, that keeping it at 100 and, you know, 145, 150 or 60 Celsius, uh, or 145 or 150 Fahrenheit or 60 Celsius. Uh, that, that may be challenging challenge. uh, for some people that don't have like an incubator but i don't know maybe um you know maybe there's ways to get around that uh and and just keep it you know hot or warm um over time yeah but- warm is better than you know as warm as you can get it towards 60 c you know the faster you're gonna get that product out yeah of the of the jar uh i don't think anything bad is gonna happen if you can keep it above 25 or 30 c yeah uh sous vide machines would be your friend here there you, you know, go like yeah that kind of thing Exactly, uh, exactly. A, a hot radiator wouldn't be a bad thing either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, setting it in your boiler room. No, <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's cool. So it is kind of like it's a vegan, and, and, and you even mentioned in the paper it's a lower-carb substitute for fish sauce and, um, and umami flavor. I guess that kind of makes sense because uh, there's going to be a number of carbohydrates that can't be – that are just even too big for aspergillus um, at, at a fish. But uh, but when you're just using you know yeast um, to get at those uh those proteins there's really not a lot of carbs there at all um you know in in the base media so but that's cool so so show you and uh yeast garum from uh from brewer spent grain and from spent yeast uh so i mean again this is so much fun and 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 you have talked about you know uh, well uh some of the other you know waste streams that you're tackling but are there other fun fruit fermentation product projects that you've got going i mean we we're in the we're kind of entering into in and are in the kombucha space we sell a a a liquid scoby starter uh that people are pretty excited about and we have a sourdough starter so like you know exploring what we can do with bread and what we can do with with kombucha what we can do with you know that kind of ends us up into vinegars at some point as well you know i think there's a lot of exciting things going on in those spaces these days uh and in general just like how can we help upcycle uh you know what would be waste to one person in the beer industry or otherwise into you know valuable products and delicious products uh that's kind of i think the direction that the food ferments department and at escarpment is heading and and, you know we spend a lot of time thinking about that and, and tinkering with weird ferments in the lab in order to really be able to speak with at least some amount of uh, knowledge about these things. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, and, and and that's, I mean, so cool to think about, you know, upcycling this weight waste stream, right? I mean, the sustainability impact of this is really, uh, really meaningful uh, and, and can be useful for breweries and home brewers and, and really anyone that's that's brewing beer. You can take these spent grains and and uh, turn it into soy sauce or, or take a spent yeast and turn it into uh, umami flavor in the the form of yeast garum. But uh, I always ask this question, if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, Jonah, what would it be? Uh, I, I mean, like, think about, uh, I don't know, but, like, both think about your inputs and then think about your outputs as far as, you know, flavor development and, you know, are you using all of what, you know, all of what you're using, are you using it to its fullest? Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, for a long time for me at least it was you know okay you know throwing the brewing grain into the garden and leaving it and it's like oh well you know you know what what else could i be creating uh yeah with with all of these inputs 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. What else could I be creating? And I mean, you can still do that too, right? You can still throw the the grains out into the garden or still send it off to the farmer. But if you take some and set it aside, um, you can make some really cool sauces uh, from it. Uh, so there's you yeah. know multiple ways to leverage your 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 spent grains. I mean, I think we're probably a ways away from you know, taking like full truckloads of spent grain and making soy sauce with that. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. but you know, who knows? I mean, maybe that's something that, that uh, we can get to in the future. But it's cool to be part of the conversation, right? Upcycling this waste stream, taking a waste stream and turning it into something that's yummy and tasty for everyone. So, uh, well, Jonah, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to today? No, I just, you know, if you can get your hands on some koji from us uh, or in general, you know, uh, it's a really incredible uh, microbe and, and uh, deserves attention and deserves, you know, respect. I think there's uh, a lot to be gained from, from microbes in general uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, be that Saccharomyces or Aspergillus or, you know, whatever else is out there. Yeah. And so much, so much that we can do with microbes, um, including beer and uh, and making these awesome seasonings. Well, Jonah, thank yeah. you so much for joining me in the Brew Lab. I, pr I love talking to you today. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been uh, it's been a real treat. It's always nice to kind of talk about some of the more niche things that we're working on. So. Yeah, yeah, and I uh, and I love it. And and listeners, for your treat, um, in the show notes, you'll find a link to Escarpment Labs website, uh, where you can uh, find information about their Koji product, as well as information about, uh, you know, different uses for Koji. And we'll also have a link to the abstract of the poster that Escarpment presented uh, at the Brewing Summit in August 2022. So if you like what you heard, shoot me an email, Kate at brewlosophy .com, and don't forget to listen to our other show, the Brewlosophy Podcast. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.